I have often mentioned in previous videos that Yu-Gi-Oh has got no promise at rotation in the same way that games like Magic the Gathering and Pokemon do, and that it instead relies almost wholly on power creep to push all the cards out of the game so that we can make their money selling players new decks multiple times a year. However, this isn't completely true, as every 3-6 to six months can we do the rotation of all the meta relevant decks. Now they call this list a BAN list, but let's be honest here, this list has been about getting rid of problematic cards for years, and it's not primarily focused on forcing decks out of the meta once they've made the company enough money. That being said, it didn't always used to be like this. In early Yu-Gi-Oh, where casual and younger players were more the focus compared to the competitive players who pick up most of Yu-Gi-Oh nowadays, Kami never felt the need to ban any cards, preferring just to limit the most powerful cards in competitive, and then hoping the power creep would take care of the rest, while they focused on printing more cards for younger audiences. And then Invasion of Chaos came out and dropped an atom bomb of power creep on the game at roughly the same time as Kami was finally starting to take competitive more seriously. In addition to several cards that were in future bannings, this set released two of the most overpowered monsters the game had seen up to this point, and that, combined with many broken spells and a few good monsters from previous sets, resulted in the first true tier 0 deck ever made, known as Yatalok Chaos. A deck so good, it's actually been able to beat decks that would be made 10 years later in Lithium's cross banless cup. So with Konami looking to expand its competitive scene, it was decided that this deck needed to be put in check, and many of its problem cards needed to go. And thus, on August 1st, 2004, we got the first ever Yu-Gi-Oh! ban list, with 13 cards on the chopping block. Welcome okay, everyone to my new series, Ban List Breakdowns, where we go through each ban list in chronological order and discuss what cards were banned, the reasons for said bannings, and whether or not they were warranted. There's 13 cards to discuss today, so let's begin. So in terms of the monsters banned, it seems Konami only had one goal here, and that was to rein in the power of Chaos decks without outright killing the deck. All four cards hit here were primarily used in this deck at the time, and broken monsters from other decks that likely should have been hit were omitted. So let's take a look at the first monsters banned in Yu-Gi-Oh! history, beginning with... arguably strongest monster printed in the first decade of Yu-Gi-Oh. Yes, you could point to cards like Dark Ham Dragon, Judgment and Dragon, or his partner in Crime Blackluster Soldier, but for my money, no monster in early Yu-Gi-Oh is as powerful as Chaos Emperor Dragon, Envoy of the End. A dragon with blue eyes stats, this card, along with its Chaos Brother, was at, at the time the easiest monster to summon with these points, requiring only a banish of one light and one dark monster from your graveyard. Now, something a massive beta for this cost by itself would be good, but this massive behemoth also came with one of the best blow up effects ever put on a card. You see, for the small cost of a thousand life points, this card not only destroys itself and every other card in the field, but also every card in both players' hands. If that wasn't crazy enough, it also burns the opponent for 300 points for each card sent to the graveyard by this effect. I think it's self-explanatory as where this card is insane by itself. This effect not only puts both players in top deck mode, but could just end the game by itself sometimes. What pushes it over the edge is when it's combined with the Metal Raiders recruiter monsters in Sangan and which are the Black Forest to break parity, leaving you with a player your opponent likely won't have access to. In addition to this, this card also had what was basically an FTK combo back in the day, when played with the recruiters as it could search another card we'll see on this list in a bit, that could lock the opponent out of ever drawing another card again. Overall, this card would still be good if it was released today. And it was absolutely a colossal mistake to release this card in 2004, so yes, this is a ban I absolutely support. In fact, this card was so powerful it took over a decade and a half to unban this card with an errata to make it basically unusable. That's how good the original version of this card was, but this monster with only one half of the Atalok crime duo, so let's continue by looking at... A spirit monster, Yasagarasu, like CED, is a great example of how underdeveloped many early Yu-Gi-Oh cards were. That's because when this card inflicts damage to an opponent, 
they skip their next draw phase. Now nowadays, where we have so many grey red effects, this isn't that bad. But back in 2004, this attacking to a player with no hand was essentially a game over. And like I said earlier, we combined with the board clearing, hand ripping bomb that was CED, this lock was almost trivial to pull off, as all you needed was a CED, which the Black Forest or Sangan, and a normal summon. But even though this card is mostly known for the Atalot combo, what's scary is you haven't even got to complete the combo to win this card. Think about it, if you attack someone with this directly and their hand is awful, the point not going to be able to remove Yatta anytime soon, meaning you can just bounce back to your hand where it's unhittable, wait, wait a turn, replay it, hit them again, and do this until they're dead. Like its partner in crime, Yatta also remains on the ban list for over a decade. In fact, until recently it had the record for the longest ban in the game's history. However, unlike CED, this card didn't actually need an errata when it came off the list, because in the years since its banning the game had become so little with creative effects that getting Yatta locked isn't actually that bad anymore, and that's even if you can find a deck to play it in, with most decks now only playing one normal summon that is usually an archetype starter. Still, the fact that this card was banned so long past the point of necessity speaks in volumes to how feared it was in its prime, and yes, at the time it absolutely needed to be banned for the health of the game. And finally, for the banned monsters section, we have the two searches that made the Yatalok possible in Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest. Two sides of the same coin, these cards upon being sent from the field to the graveyard can search for a monster with low stats. In Sangan's case, it's a monster with 1500 or less attack points, and in Witch's case, 1500 or less defense points. Now, even ignoring the combo with the two previous cards, both of these cards are played in almost every deck not named Burn, as they each granted access to some of the game's best cards at the time, such as Magician of Faith, Magical Merchant, Knight Assailant, all the Magic Ruler Searchers, and in Witch's case, all the Monarchs, Summon Skull, Berserk Gorilla, and many other powerful beaters. So yeah, these two really help make early decks more consistent and powerful, with their easy access to most cards played in the game competitively at the time. However, like Yatta, these really good cards were made far too strong by CED, as one activation of that card would result in the opponent having no cards in their hand or in play, and you were the Yatta Garasu in hand, which preferred you hadn't used it in almost one this turn, meant an instant game over. Now you could make the argument that these two cards didn't deserve to get banned at the time, and that they were merely a casualty of the chaos hits, and I would half agree. Honestly, as good as it was back then, I don't think Sangai needed to go, and being put to one was enough. I think Kami agreed with me on this, because the card came back to one a few months later, and while it has been a staple in GOAT format, I don't think many GOAT players would argue it needs to be banned. Which, however, I think even a set of chaos was a justified hit, as I do believe this card would have been a major problem in formats like GOAT following Chaos's ban. Firstly, she would have been a nightmare in Monarch decks, which became far more powerful with the hits to Chaos, and tributing a witch for a Monarch and then getting a second Monarch sounds broken, as does searching Trevor Infecting Virus in GOAT Control, or any of the best beaters in Earth Aggro and Beast Down. Overall, I think Kami got it mostly right with the Witch, CED, and Yatta bans, but I do think that the Sangan ban was a bit of an overkill. So three good hits and one iffy but untenable one means this list is off to an okay start, but it would be remiss of me not to mention that the FTK enabling Magical Scientist was not banned yet, and that's what I consider to be the biggest mistake in regards to monsters on this ban list, as once it was in effect, Scientist FTK became a top deck in the format once more, making the latter power 2004 miserable for competitive players until it was hit on the second list, which then ushered in the first great Yu-Gi-Oh format in GOAT. Anyway, let's move on to the meat of this list with the seven broken spells. Now Yu-Gi-Oh back in 2004 was nothing like it is nowadays, with its archetypes, fast gameplay and a whole game taking place over a few long, hopefully back and forth turns. To be blunt, it was basically a worse version of Magic the Gathering in its early days, with its slow resource based gameplay that was dominated by cards that didn't stay on the field. 
as such, most of the game's strongest cards were poorly designed spell cards that granted too much card advantage, had too strong an impact on the board, or just ended the game way too fast. And what's scary is that most of these cards are still banned to this day. Sure, a few have been power kept off the list, but many of these cards are still too strong for the game nowadays after 20 years of power creep. There are six busted cards to talk about, and one other card. So let's take a look, shall we? First up, we have one of the most iconic cards in the game in Monster Reborn. And I choose to start with this one because it highlights, in my opinion, the philosophy that was used when making this first list, especially in regards to spell bans, which is ban the best card in the category and then promote the slightly weaker versions of the same effect. You see, at the time, all three Graveyard Rivals cards were seeing some level of play with this, Premature Burial, and Call of the Haunted. However, of these three, not with Monster Reborn the most widely played, it's also the only one that helps people circumvent this list in some way, and thus was the first on the chopping block. You see, while all three of these cards can revive one of its controller's monsters from the graveyard, Monster Reborn has two things that make it far stronger than its contemporaries. Firstly, it's not a continuous effect attached to the revived monster, keeping it in play like Call and Barrier are, meaning it offers the opponent less options when trying to interact with you. And secondly, it can also revive an opponent's card as well, which I think kind of might have seemed a bit problematic at this time. Firstly, not everyone was using sleeves at this point in the game, and I think card damage was a somewhat of a concern for Konami, with players taking each other's cards out of the graveyard. But more importantly, so this card technically let you circumvent the limited list. You see, with so few cards at the time being actually competitively viable, almost all decks played a lot of the same cards, like Jinzo, Break of the Magical Warrior, Trap Fighting Virus, etc. And many of those cards ended up on the limited list, meaning they were only allowed at one copy per deck. However, when both players were playing that limited card, this card could eventually be a second copy of that card for both players, which kind of defeats the purpose of putting them on the limited list in the first place, much the same way that cards like Demonic Tutor and Regrowth did in Early Magic the Gathering. Now personally, I think Monster of Bond's ban was a bit of an overreaction, especially when several far worse cards remain untouched. But given where the game was at this point, I will put my own things aside and say, yeah, this was a good ban. Reborn would get one for my off list in 2008, but was still deemed too powerful and was rebanned again before being tried twice more in 2011 and 2013. And eventually in 2018, it might come off the list for good. Again, I think this was a solid card. I think it wasn't that strong enough to need a ban, but I can see where they were coming from. Up next we've got my personal most hated card on this list, the one card I dread seeing whenever I play GOAT format. It's the Linkwood Duo. Now Spell re released several hand stack cards into the game including Confiscation, the Force of Sentry and this card. But at the format of those three, only takes one card out of your opponent's hand. This Abomination, on the other hand, takes a card at random and then a card of their choice to rub salt into the wound. Yes, you don't get the hand knowledge you would get from the first two cards, but I think taking over a third of the opponent's opening hand more than makes up for that. And what does this incredible effect cost you? A thousand life points. Yeah, that's all. Now, I don't think I need to explain why this card was banned. The last thing Kami wanted was players losing most of their hand turn 1 and quitting the game in disgust. But what is shocking to me is that they unbanned this card a few months later when GOAT came about. Yes, I'll discuss this more in the GOAT ban list, but to be blunt, I think this GOAT will be infinitely better without this card in it. Because not only does this card make the game more sucky, it also requires players to play a bunch of bad cards to counter it. Duo lasted one more format before getting banned again, and to that I say good riddance. I think this is one of the best bannings on this list, and my only complaint was they've reversed it. Next! For my most hated member of the GOAT trinity to my favourite, we now have Graceful Charity. Simple yet powerful, this normal spell lets controller draw 3 cards for the cost of discarding 2. Now yes, unlike Pot of Greed, this card didn't give you any card advantage, as to drawing 3 cards and losing 3 between Charity and the discards. However, what it does offer is excellent graveyard setup and great card selection, letting me the best possible hand for pitching two cards, likely with graveyard synergy to both trigger effects and set up cards like the Chaos Monsters, or to lean back with something like Call of the Haunted or Premature Burial. A staple of both casual and competitive, this can make me have a fun gameplay, but it needs to be to make decks more consistent, I'd absolutely need to get banned. 
because I'm sorry, no card that can potentially lead to a turn one Yatta lock or BLS should be legal in 2004. And this card coming back and being angry with the best card in GOAT proves they were right to ban it. As much as I love this card, it should never still like the day of Gen because it's just too strong. Up next, we're going to kill two birds with one stone. We're talking about the other two cards from LOB that got banned in the form of the board wipes Dark Hole and Regeki. Both normal spells, these cards are both here for the same reason. That being that they could both wipe the opponent's field clean with just one card, leaving their control with either a massive mount in card or field advantage, or the easiest comeback to a bad situation in history. We'll begin with Raigeki as it's the easiest one to explain why it was powerful enough to eat a ban. The simplest effect on this list, this card just destroys every monster on the opponent's side of the field. No cost, no activation requirements, no effect on the user. In fact, for over a decade, until it was eventually unbanned in the 2010s, this card was one of the poster children for how broken many early Yu-Gi-Oh cards were. Whether you needed to clear the opponent's field to push a direct attack through, blow up the opponent's field to reset the game when things were going bad, or just dealing with a couple of monsters you couldn't beat in battle, Rikki could find one of the best ways of doing this, and it's that flexibility and power that makes this an easy target for a banning. Now Dark Hole, on the other hand, wasn't as strong as Raigeki at the time, as it destroys every monster on the field, including its controllers, when it couldn't usually be used to clear the field and attack directly for a win anywhere near as often. However, it does possess some qualities that Raigeki lacks. Firstly, when you have few or no monsters on the field, it just is another Raigeki. And like its counterpart, Dark Hole is exceptionally good at evening the odds against overextending opponents. Secondly, Dark Hole is really good at feeling your own graveyard effects. For example, in the aforementioned Chaos decks, this card could be used to send Light and Darks to the grave to easily get out Chaos monsters, and it could even be a substitute for CED when it came to doing the Yasser lock combo, as this plus the Melbader Searcher left you with a Yasser on the field that, unless you want already has something to do with in your hat in their hand, meant game over. And finally, Dark Hole could be good at removing monsters placed on your field by the opponent that you don't want. Now granted, this is more in use in modern Yu-Gi-Oh with the likes of Nightmare Cup to Ipley running around. However, when this list came out, Lava Golem was legal and seen play in burn decks as with moving big threats and inflicting burn damage, so that part wasn't completely useless either. So overall, yes, I do believe that both these cards deserve their bannings, as at the time they both did too much for too little, with them being able to potentially trade one card for three to five of the opponents, and getting sacked by this card when you were in the leads were the ultimate field bads of early Yu-Gi-Oh, which I imagine can be thought would turn players off. I think Yu-Gi-Oh in the 2000s was a lot more skill-based without this card, and I think this banning is one of the better ones we have here. Take everything busted about Raigeki and then have it hit cards with far less graveyard synergies at the time and you have the absolutely busted Harpy's Feather Duster which destroys all back row the opponent controls with no cost to the user. So this is basically Raigeki for, for back row which may look just good to many but at the time this card was way better than Raigeki for one reason. Most spells and traps back then had no use in the graveyard. This essentially made Harpies a far less risky card to fire off aggressively, and the fear of a blowout from this card was even worse than its monster moving counterparts, resulting in formats where players were hesitant to set multiple back row. Now you could make the argument that this card is less powerful than Hole and Regeki, since a player could just chain their back row to your duster to limit its usefulness. However, there are two problems with this. One, outside of Burn, most decks at this time only set battle traps, like Mirror Force and Sakuretsu Armor, which obviously can't be chained to this. Sure, there were cards like Drop Off, Dust Shoot and Ring of Destruction that were played at the time, but oftentimes setting multiple back room meant at minimum trading one form with Duster and usually losing two or three more cards in the process. And two, even if you were playing Burn, just to often force you to activate your traps at inopportune times, making them far less effective. For example, if you were to set just desserts, you'd want to either wait for a full board of monsters or a jammer trio before activating it for maximum damage. However, Duster could force out the activation against only one monster, making this brutal burn card merely a quick play Hinotama. This meant even if this card didn't have the biggest impact versus burn, it could still be highly disruptive to that deck. Not to mention removing cards like Gravity Binds and Lanthalmeria B. So with its ability to essentially end back row heavy games in one shot, as lack of a downside, yes, this card should have absolutely been banned. It's not that bad nowadays, but it was way too strong in 2004 and could just end games on the spot. 
Dust we get off the list of 2020, which, like Yatta, makes one of the longest banned cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! history. However, its unbanned didn't cause much of a problem, similar to Yatta's, because 1. The game is now so fast the card is only good in the side deck when you're going first versus a deck like Labyrinth, for example, and 2. The game has much more background now that can either occur itself, like the Runic cards, or has effects in the graveyard, like Labyrinth and Eldritch. Now we do have one other spell to cover, and if you know anything about old school Yu-Gi-Oh! and its busted spells, what card do you think it would be? Painful choice with its effect that lets you draw 5 cards essentially? Snatch Steel with its arguably better change of heart effect? Or maybe Mirage of Nightmare with its combos that can draw 4 cards? Nope, it's United We Stand. Yeah, I'm sorry, what? Okay, so any of these for those who don't know is an equip card that gives the monster it's equipped to a whopping 800 point boost that every monster its controller has on the field. Now, while well, yes, that this was pretty decent at the time, as the entry point boost that can go to 4k is something to sneeze at, was this really the card needed to go? Sure, it had seen some play in beatdown decks at the time, but like I said earlier, this card was banned over the likes of Painful Choice, Change of Heart, and Pot of Greed, among others, and I don't think anyone would argue that those cards weren't more deserving of a hit. The only explanation I can think of that can be worth that scapegoat decks would rise up in the wake of the chaos bannings, and that a two-card combo that resulted in a 4k monster would be too strong for the game. And I guess I can see where they're coming from to an extent, but um, two points against this. One, this was a combo that was hard to set up with neither pieces being searchable, and two, it would have entered a format where 90% of the decks were running things like Mirror Force, Ring of Destruction, Sekiro's Drama, etc. So likely it wouldn't have done much before the monster that you equipped this card to gets destroyed. So yes, in case you couldn't tell, no, I don't think this card should have been banned. I think Kami agreed because this card only lasted a couple of months on the list for being removed prior to GOAT format, where it did pretty much nothing of note other than see play in the very obscure Ben Coyote K deck. So overall, six pretty good hits and one bad one. Not too shabby for the first time banning cards. Again, my, my main complaint here is more what they didn't hit than what they did, with a notorious FTK enabler and arguably best card ever made, painful choice somehow sitting off the hook. A decision that would come back to bite them in the ass, as the card enabled several more FTKs before eventually getting the chop. So we're almost finished now, so let's conclude by looking at... And finally, we only have two traps to talk about on this list, because apparently United We Stand was too strong for modern Yu-Gi-Oh at the time, but not, oh, I don't know, Son Judgment, Ring of Destruction? No, Konami? Oh well, anyway, let's begin. First up, we continue this list's theme of hitting on board wipes with Mirror Force. A normal trap, this card only triggers when an important declares an attack, and it also only destroys top position monsters. So in theory, this card is much more restrictive than the likes of Dark One Regeki, but in reality, it being a trap and thus being able to be used during the opponent's turn actually made it just as impactful on the game at the time, especially from a psychological perspective, much in the same way as cards like Storm and Dust to do. Well, like those cards, this card also encourages very conservative play, with many players at the time not committing more than one monster in attack position at a time until this card was dealt with. Now, I imagine the slow games this card encouraged was the reason it got banned, as no TCG company wants their game to be seen as boring. In this case, however, I think Kami overacted a little bit, as games with this card legal, while slower, are also often more tactical and methodical than games without it, as seen in many good format matches. And I think Kami may have agreed with me on this, because this card was unbanned on the next big list, and has made a powerful but not broken staple in GOAT to this day. And for our final banned card, we have not just one of the best cards on this whole list, but maybe the most overpowered and badly designed trap card ever made in Imperial Order. Arguably the most powerful floodgate of all time, this card in its pre erratic form negates all spells as others on the field. However, give them credit, they tried to balance this effect out with a maintenance cost of 700 life points you have to pay during each of your standby phases to keep this card on the field. However, not only is this not really a cost, it actually makes this card even more broken if you can believe it. 
Now, even if you didn't exploit the maintenance cost of this card, it was still broken as it shut off access to over a third of both players' decks, and you'd never play this card unless you were already in a winning position, so it will always hurt the opponent more than you. For example, in 2004, this card was a great card to play once you had a Chaos Monster on the board, as a mentor opponent needed to out one of the most powerful cards in the game at the time without access to Dark Hole, Rageki, or any card like Smashing Ground. In fact, one of the best times to use this card was in response to a board wipe, to both fill the card and make your opponent waste one of the best cards in the game at the time. However, this card in its pre acid form was actually better if you never paid its maintenance cost and just let it die the turn after you activated it. This is because often one negative an opponent's spell and a guaranteed turn of no follow up spells can be such a massive swinging advantage that it by itself can win you the game as depending on the hand the opponent had when you played this, you were essentially just skipping their turn. In addition to this, this card is actually a decent combo with certain spells if you can believe it. I know that, that sounds very weird, but a card that could be used to have the balancing downsides of broken spells is not surprisingly really good. The best example of this is of course Mirage of Nightmare, a continuous spell that on your opponent's turn let, let you draw two out four cards in your hand, but then to make up for this you have to discard the same number of cards at random during your own turn. However, because of this card, Often you didn't even need to pay this cost, you just activated the, the card, drew your four cards, and then because it was negated under this during your turn, you just kept all the cards you drew from this, making Mirage Nightmare a plus four. Oh, and just by the way, Mirage Nightmare, another card banned after United We Stand. No, I will not get over this. So for its birthday, it shut down a large part of the game and removed downsides from broken spells. Yes, I think it's safe to say that Order should have absolutely been banned. In fact, alongside Yatagarasu and CD, this card remained banned for over a decade until 2017. Where like CD, it was released with an errata, that made the maintenance cost not optional and also doubled its rate as you had to pay during both play summary phase, not just your own. Unlike CED, however, this card errata did not help make it less powerful, as in the 13 years between this card's banning and release, decks have become much more powerful and faster, with men no longer needing many spells to play, and most decks being able to win much quicker, meaning the life point cost didn't really matter that much. Because of this, a card like Order, that could just be an I win button against certain decks like Sky Striker, was still as powerful as it had ever been, and was seen playing a lot of decks before again being banned in February 2022, even with the errata. And honestly, I think this card should just stay banned, because there's no way you can make turning a third of the game off balanced. So in conclusion, I think the first ban list did its job fairly well, as it did knock Chaos decks off their perch of the best deck for a while. However, I do wish Kremlin had thought about what would come after this, as like I said, this list would result in FTK decks regaining prominence for a little bit, before Warriors and eventually Go Control took over, leading to one of the best formats in Yu-Gi-Oh! history. But that's a video for another day everyone, so see you all next time.